Hello there guys, this is a video that's going to show you a really excellent A-grade photography unit of work from A-level that we've had from a couple of years ago, as you probably know, we can't put stuff that is on as live work. It's all about, uh, and you can see the essay tool just on the screen right there, it says, how do artists and photographers use portraits to convey and contradict society's idealisation of glamour and the feminine form? That's what her entire investigation focuses on. She would have spent roughly about 10 months on this and this is a summary of the investigation that she would have then uh, produced everything that you do all the way through is recorded in our center in two main workbooks but that's also accompanied by essential sheets with a portfolio and a separate little work portfolio as well and the most crucial part which is the essay which is approximately about 3,000 words some schools will do that embedded in powerpoint or in a slightly different way but we just choose to do it for an essay as we've had better feedback from that from universities. The essential sheets parts, and this is the first one that's on the screen right here. This is a little culmination showing examples of the student's work in the middle, the artist inspiration, and then a little brief summary of that image on the right hand side. That's also explained in further depth in the essay to show the connections and the context of what you have then looked at in your investigation. This sheet here is more to do with the images and it's just a communication with the examiner and the people looking at your work, the types of images that you've selected to be the best representation of your theme. This sheet here contextualizes and explains everything from the theme to the connections that you've looked at and developments that you've made all along the way. And it helps to have separate standalone sheets as well as this when you're looking through the whole unit of work because the whole thing all in one big go is a lot to take in. So a couple of sheets like this one, the rationale and the other ones that just shown you are really helpful in showing your ideas to the examiner. This one here is the outcome sheet that just shows specific examples of final pieces, whether that is standalone photographs, developments in Photoshop or using film, whatever the views that they believe are the outcomes and resolutions to the work. This one's a lot more simpler. This is just a circle content sheet or it's like a, a circle crop sheet, just revealing a different format for the images, just to throw something different out there and create a little bit of variety. At the end of the video, you'll see some slightly bigger images on the screen of the standalone shots as most times that you will view work when it's in schools, they'll often be on a screen, not just in workbooks and sheets as we do at our place. Um, but this is the kind of thing you can expect to see at the end of the video. This image here is an image of the essay, a couple of pages from there that just show the question title, the same as on that first little image that I showed you there. And that question title is really the key thing that you need to drive towards. You don't have to have that right at the start. And in the case of most students, they'll come up with a more refined and a more specific theme as your investigations progress. Not every student will make a portfolio specifically separately, but in the case of you guys who've been going through the corona crisis, that sort of thing, now you guys might have had to make portfolios for uni interviews to submit a portfolio. So it's just good practice to get into. And I've showed um, excerpts from this student's portfolio right at the end of the video. The types of things that you can expect to see, uh, this is a book page that was taken right from the end. It's a really, really good example of explaining your ideas once you've got partly way through the book so it's a mixture of annotation artist images and your own images and just bringing the whole thing together it's always worth making pages like this this is the first page it's just got a little copy of the essay i also have a couple of copies digitally and otherwise just in case one goes awry or put in a drawer somewhere this page here a bit more simplistic just straight to the point showing your intentions this was actually wrote about two or three months into the investigation this is the first page. You'll often start off with mood boards, whether that's Pinterest, whether that's uh, on Google, whatever you can find in terms of images that could inspire you from books, you know, television influences, anything like that, all involved in the research. A little bit of um, testing out of ideas using like mind mapping and mood board and that sort of thing, all of which will help to show the examiner what your initial ideas are. After that stage, once you've done that, I then get my students to do a little bit more in-depth research where they talk about the post-process, the pre-planning of what they'll be looking at. They think about the artist in more depth and target ways to then explore in their own work. So a couple of pages here, making rough notes at the top there first, and then getting a more refined and more typed out version at the bottom, which is really, really useful and gets you in good practice for writing about the different things and bits and bobs in your essay. This page, even though you've took photography and you think, what's this drawing page doing in here? The drawing page is really, really important, really quick. It's not about the quality of the drawings, but it's about the recording. So that will get you marks for the AO3, which normally is just reserved for the actual recording of photographs. But here you're recording ideas. So record your ideas, think about your ideas. It doesn't matter how basic they are, 
It's the communication of those ideas to the person who's looking at your book. And a lot of the ideas that you'll see on this page here impact on pretty much all of the sets that uh, the student then takes. You can go back and add to it, or it might just be that you add drawings into the set pages or the planning pages that you go and that you do as you go along. Here's the first couple of sets. Now, as the work is based on societal norms and the pressure of social media and things like that, she wanted to look at something that was to do with the feminine process. So she chose shaving of the legs and shaving of the armpits. A little bit of an awkward thing to have to ask your model to photograph, but it was directly inspired by the artist that she was looking at. So that formed the first couple of sets. You can't really sort of communicate how important it is to always annotate your contact sheets. Don't just put them in your book as piecemeal. They have to go in and you have to engage with them. I always say to my students, don't just slap it straight in the book, spread out your contacts, look at them. Don't just evaluate which ones are the best ones to take forward. Think about, could anything you know, be joined? Could these two contacts here on the screen, it was the patterns that were being made that were unintentional at the start of the unit, but they came into ideas for tessellating and repeating images as time went on. There's a third set, looking more at the actual object itself, looking at the razor, the glitter was just to highlight the part that is generally the hair, which is something you're trying to take away. The glitter was then trying to highlight that in the same way that you might use glitter makeup or things like that, that I don't quite understand, not being of the makeup kind myself. And as uh, then it develops on, developments are then shown. Just some quick ideas using Photoshop, just to process images, layer images together to see what could be achieved. Some of the more successful ones were included in the book. And unfortunately, this student got rid of the some one of the ones that didn't work so well. Please don't do that. Put the ones that didn't work so well in your book and write about why they didn't. Even if you stick a line through them so we know it's clearly something you don't like, it shows that process as these developments go on. She refines it a little bit more. She didn't quite like the messiness of the glitter itself when it was on the edges of images. So she sharpened up the selections of images and showed things in series and uh, processes because that was what she'd particularly selected all the way through, not just about like, presenting the images. Try and put your images and information together so you're always contextualizing what you're doing, whether that's in annotation or it might be such as on this image on the screen here where print screens are used to explain the process, but then also explain the idea behind what you're doing because the person who's looking at your work might not have a clue how you've done it. And then mixing up larger images, more showcase images in your book with some of the smaller ones just helps to give a good size break. So think about what's the size of your images. If everything looks exactly the same, it might get a bit too plain and it might not just break that experience up for the person who's looking for your book. Moving on to set two, not that this person was obsessed with like waxing or shaving or anything like that. There's nothing too weird about that. It's just another process that people are put into pressure to do within society to fit in with a societal norm. She did like the idea of the, the cutting, the pasting, and the series that she was using from the initial development she made. So she carried that forward into this set and then explains it further in the other pages that she's making uh, before she then decides to then move on. Those are the first three or four sets that she planned to do, and that's how they resolve themselves. As you move through the book, don't just leave your research to the beginning. It's always good to go back and think, have my ideas changed? Is there anything else that I could involve in this? And look at the work, not just directly creating another copy of what you've done, but really think about the idea. Could an element be pushed further? Could it be the portrait? Could it be the prop? Could it be the element? Could it be the location? Think about what you could do with that. Sometimes it might be the artist that you look at. And in this case, um, this artist research page that you can see on the screen here is looking at a series of artists that aren't directly related to her theme, but they had ideas, techniques, approaches that they wanted to involve in their work, whether that was the use of more art space approaches or the use of projection and restricted lighting in the sets that she was then going to plan. She also then puts in a Where Am I Now page, and sometimes students do this just to give a little brief summary of where that person was at that point and then what they were intending to do after that point. That's then followed by little combined images, or in this case, big combined images that will be made on Photoshop to summarize different parts of the investigation. Moving back into retake for the uh, leg shave set, she wasn't quite happy with the first angle that she took. So she looked back at different artists. She tried to think about refining the viewpoint, changing the lighting, changing the coloration of the glitter and slightly altering the camera settings just to increase that, the detail slightly, just by having a little play around with the ISO and then the F number as well. All of which she then explains in the different bits of information on the bits of flaps or hinges that you see in the book right on the screen there. She moved on to then uh, cosmetic portraits. This was more of a, a direct recreation of the artist who she was looking at in her research. And then she wanted to take direct elements from that 
and then recreate that. It was something that resonated with her from an early point. She liked the idea of using colour isolation. Sometimes we advise against that because it can be seen quite frequently in students' work. But in this case, it's something that she chose that she wanted to investigate. She then looks into the, the actual glitter itself. And instead of just using it on the razor, as she did earlier on, she used that in a sort of a glamorous way, but to actually create more subtly disturbing portraits that were showing a different angle, a different sort of connection to the theme, which she then experiments in Photoshop again, and then brings back the razor element into it by using that as an element to reveal the image. So it's almost like uh, the, the image has been shaved away by the razor, which was something that she found that she, when she was trying to find ideas to mix the sets together, that was something that she then came up with. Print screens are used to explain again, how has she done this? What's she done it for? What's the reason? What's the connection of the glitter? Everything's explained all the way along. So that's really, really key. She then created and wanted to create something a little bit more photographic. So she created a prop where she printed off different images of social media images and then used a model and different types of projected light to create different scenarios to then photograph um, in darker light conditions, similar to the glitter set, but different to the brighter qualities that she got in the other sets. Again, experimenting in Photoshop, it's something that she really enjoyed doing. She liked the way that it combined lots of different images together. And that's what you can see across these couple of book pages here. Really, really good quality of explanation again. Before she then goes into this page here, uh, which just reads as my theme, but as soon as it goes on to the next bit there, it's like a little flap that breaks in between called My Theme Contextualized, which looks at how does it connect to a theme and what other ideas crucially on that right hand side that you can see there so she's using the glitter the idea was to spread around objects to then reveal a, a void or a nothing space uh, which was then trying to then latch onto the emotional quality of the some of the emotions that were experienced by people who feel this pressure so using the glitter in more of an abstract way gave her a different potential for a set of images to then take so that was unplanned in the ideas for what she'd do next. She also liked the idea of having the person saturated in some way, not just by glitter or the actual portrait themselves, by using then photographs of, of other people who were quite prevalent on social media and using that as a means to show oversaturation in large numbers over the portrait themselves. And that became the basis for the next set. As that moves on, she then tries to use more Photoshop. She revisits the glitter as well and looks at the social media and the glitter of it being used as a projected form. You might remember from that research that you just saw about a minute or so ago, that little bit of the research there, that's then impacted on this future set that she's then taken. She then takes smaller images of those social media objects and then uses them as um, almost like more like transfers or tattoos to add to the face. And so she's trying to then refine her approach using a similar idea, but approaching it in a different way revisits the idea of like going back away from the portraits again and looked at the idea inspired from an, art, an artist where it was a uh, champagne foot wash. You could have a little look into that and read that, the information about it, but it's all explained, all contextualized. And then she mixes the idea of that sort of like glamorous element of using champagne and the glitter in some of the way of uh, developing her images that she chose to do. She then sort of like pulls back her ideas, thinks about making a plan for sets and organizing all of the different sets that she's taken into numbers of ways of showing outcomes. So that's then just explained here on the set plan page and her intentions for the next bits of development she's doing. She then looks at this artist here, Shaquille, not to be confused with Shaquille O'Neal there, the basketball player, uh, but the artist instead. And then she looks at the artist, recreates that, but using more of the portrait and less of the crop idea that she then had from before relates it to other artists as well not just photographers it's about material shock and creating that potential for the viewer which she's then linked back to who is probably the mother of all textual shock which was Merritt Oppenheim who's very well known for her furry teacup and saucer as then she moves through she uses those ideas and combines them using photoshop to show things in a series before she then goes back and investigates potentials for bringing the the glitter into showing less subtle themes of textual shock by covering someone's arm totally in the glitter so it becomes an actual useless object and defeats the actual purpose of using the glitter and instead overwhelms the set which is again relating to the feelings that people feel by the oversaturation from social media i didn't think i'd become so psychological in this video but there we go now this next set was one of my absolute favorites because of its just pure simplicity and looking at the idea of i lash extensions, but then appropriating it in a different way by using hair extensions instead. So in what could look like someone is transforming into Chewbacca here is, is just very sort of like plainly showing you that something when used, not how it's meant to be used, can create a very, very different effect on a set. And even though we know hair extensions shouldn't be going there, there's nevertheless a beauty product and could be subverted 
to create a different impact, which is what the whole idea behind your theme was. And it was the sort of the crispness of this set and how simple and to the point it was that then led to this being a more prominent set in what she was then looking at doing. And then she moved on to looking at cosmetic objects. And the idea was that she'd use those objects in a large saturated amount in lots of numbers like she did with the Polaroids, uh, like she did with the different elements that she'd used throughout and use those to create a series of layered images. So the person was then only visible through cosmetic double exposures, which you can see on the screen right here. She explains how she's done it. She includes little print screens. She then looks at artists as well as photographers that use this idea in the work, maybe not sometimes directly, but more as an idea or a concept in the work that they're doing. She then takes that idea of layering a little bit further, layers back into objects, elements, it might be areas of hair, areas of the face, to see what different potential images that she could then get. Now, this was at the point where she was then looking at sort of applying to unis. So she then started to generate, in this case, they asked for a PDF portfolio, which she made up on PowerPoint, where she summarized the work using images from her books, different things like that, and put them all together in a format that could be sent off to uni to give a summary of what she was doing. I'll include that at the end of the video so you can see it. And then she capitalizes on that idea that she had previously, which was about putting the objects down onto a black or a white surface, putting the glitter totally over the top of them and removing that object to create a void, to create a shape or a space, which you could then experiment with in terms of layering into. The idea then sort of like of, of creating this void or a gap or a space, a shape to present her images in, then came about with her thinking about the coil of a hairdryer. So she overlapped the uh, wire of the hairdryer in different ways. She looked at using the glitter to create shapes in there or the, the glitter blowing by the hairdryer. So it's again changing the actual function of that element, in this case, creating a little bit of a textual confusion because hairdryers should blow air and not glitter unless someone's looking to uh, create uh, difficulties for the boomers out there amongst uh, amongst them, like I am, who detest glitter with all of their being. Um, the idea then spread directly back to Mary Oppenheim, where she used fur to create a fur teacup. So she created a furry hairdryer, which is, again, another terrifying object that obviously if you got wet, if you've ever had dogs in the past and you've owned dogs, you'd know that wet hair and heat don't really combine well together. Um, taking those images of the hairdryer, she went back and, and cleaned those images up, corrected them and used the actual coil of the hairdryer to present the images inside, as well as then using the voids and the spaces made by the hairdryer to create different potentials for layered images. To finalise the work, her idea was to, to use effective combinations to show the glitter hair drying, blowing out the different images, symbolise the, the, the chaos experienced by, you know, not knowing which ideal to follow, what product should you use. There's so much out there that it becomes very confusing. And that idea of control was then used in the, um, the functional object of a marionette, which is like a little puppety device. And what her idea was is that she'd use the marionette, she'd connect that to a previous set and use that marionette as a element and as a form to show that different connection to a theme. That then moved forward and she then used the marionette with spaces in between to then create different layered potentials for the work that she then made. Um, it wasn't necessarily her most favoured work. She did go back and revisit some of the shaved elements and quite like preferred the idea of like the shave part. And then it just finishes off on that, that page that I showed you right at the beginning, which is all about how do those artists and the sets that she's done so far, those developments connect to her work and ideas. Throughout the rest of the video, I'll just include a few images here, just zooming by, just showing different developments uh, that might not have been as clear to see in different sets. It might not have been as obvious to see in some of the little book pages there that use a range of Photoshop. They've used a, a different software to correct the images. And then it's then a matter of printing and presenting those images together to create a different amount of outcomes, all of which she then explained in her essay, explained in the outcome sheet, which then made um, a really, really sort of like good connection to her theme. This image here is just that, that first slide of her uh, PowerPoint that she's then sent off to uni. Now, generally, the, the PowerPoint, you can have to decide how much imagery do you include, how much text do you include. Generally, it's a good rule to never include any more information than it takes a breath to say, unless you're like me, where I just like, I know I'm going to keep on rabbiting on a little bit, but it's generally less text is generally better. On the first slide, you might want a little bit more information, but on the second one, like this one and this third one here, generally a smaller amount of text because you want to let your images do the talking for you. So a mixture of book work so they can see your ability to make evidence and record evidence, as well as the actual images themselves. 
as you go to uni, it will be less about the evidence and written recording, and it will be more about perfecting, if that is photography that you're going to purely, um, perfecting the actual individual images and having refinement and sophistication in the development of those images. And it's less about the written connection. But because it's A-level, it's that advanced level, you have to show written understanding at every single point you go through. So whether it's like this page here, to the layering or all the way through to the leg shaving, just that little bit of idea explanation is good because those people won't ever have uh, spoken to you before and they might just need that little bit of information to um, get to grips with what you are trying to achieve in your work. So this is just bringing uh, to a close now, just the last few pages of this portfolio should be pretty much zooming by, just again showing book pages, showing ideas, showing developments, and uh, all of which hopefully has helped that little bit. If you've got any questions, please message me through the channel. Uh, apart from that, have a lovely summer. Thank you very much, guys. Toodles.